Hey! Get me another one. Not if you throw it against my bar again. Come on, Doc. Uh, don't make me kick you out of here. You're one of my best customers. Just get me another bourbon. I think you've had enough for one night, Doc. I'll decide when I've had enough, damn it. I can still feel. I still hurt. I haven't had enough until I stop hurting. Understand? Now bring me another goddamn bottle. Dr. McCoy, I believe the bartender is correct in his assessment. Perhaps you should consider allowing your liver an opportunity to... recuperate. Where the hell did you come from? Vulcan. I know that, you green-blooded hobgoblin. The pointed ears are always my first clue. I meant, Doctor, that I just returned from visiting my home planet. I cut short my intended sabbatical when I heard of... the incident. The incident? Jim's dead! You cold, emotionless bastard. He was your best friend. Probably the closest thing you ever had to a brother. And he's dead. Dead. How can you not feel anything? I mourn his passing, Doctor. Poppycock. Under all that logical Vulcan statue-like pretense, you must feel something. You must hurt, Spock. Don't you hurt? Not in the way humans do. Bull. You're half human, even if you never admit it. And that human half just lost its anchor to emotion. The only thing that kept you connected to your human heritage, that forced you to feel something, anything, is gone. Now you really have lost your soul. Doctor, I believe that the alcohol has impaired your better judgment. Perhaps it would be best to discontinue this line of discussion. Hit a nerve, did I? Ha! That'll be the day. With Jim gone, you'll freeze up like Rura Pente. He tried to show you how to be human, you know. Now he's dead. And I don't think you'll ever learn the lesson he was trying to teach you. Dr. McCoy. All right, all right. Secure from red alert, Spock. Well, I guess I can't avoid you. Have a seat. You may as well join me. Thank you, Dr. McCoy. I would enjoy that. The sad truth is... I envy you. I wish I could just turn off my feelings like a damn light switch. Snap my fingers and poof, no more pain. James T. Kirk is dead. The universe moves on. I move on. It would be so simple. Purging emotion is not simple, Dr. McCoy. It never has been. And Jim's loss is indeed difficult. Well, at least you're not a complete frozen wasteland then. Thank God for small miracles. So when did you get back from Vulcan? 4.32 hours ago. After checking in with Starfleet Command, I beamed to the Enterprise to pay my respects to Captain Harriman. The Enterprise? That's not the blasted Enterprise. It's the Excelsior with water wings. The recent modifications to the basic Excelsior design make the new subclass even more well-equipped to explore the... Oh, spare me the engineering lecture. I'm a doctor, not a shipbuilder. My apologies. Speaking of engineers, did you have a chance to see Scotty yet? He was not on board the Enterprise, and after returning to the surface, I immediately endeavored to find you. This is the seventh drinking establishment you visited in the last 16 hours. More like the ninth. Indeed. Tracking you down was not a simple matter. I wasn't exactly looking to advertise my whereabouts. That much is certain. Nevertheless, I felt it appropriate to seek your presence. We were, after all, a triumvirate of sorts. The Three Musketeers? Yeah, that was us.
more precisely, I would conjecture, the id, ego, and superego, to put it in psychological terms. That's an interesting way to look at it, Spock. I'm assuming you'd be the superego. Logical, rational, holding back the emotions. And in Freudian psychology, the id is all about feeling and acting on instinct rather than thinking it through. And then the ego listens to both sides and decides on the best course of action. Yeah, I guess that was you, me, and Jim. Although he did have a strong id himself. Put a pretty girl in the room and you could see his id jump right out of his pants. Doctor. Oh, get a sense of humor, Spock. We need to remember the captain for who he really was. Not some paragon on a pedestal. Jim Kirk had his flaws, his weaknesses. He also had his strengths. He laughed. He cried. He got scared. He got angry. He felt things. He was human with a capital H. He was an impressive man. A masterful starship commander. And a good friend. I'll drink to that. Or I would. If only someone would bring me another goddamn bourbon. You hear me over there? I suspect, Doctor, that the bartender has developed a selective deafness when it comes to your specific attempts to acquire additional liquid refreshment. Oh yeah? Well, screw him. Last time I'll ever come here. You hear that, you lazy, good-for-nothing sh- Really, Doctor. I believe he has only your best interests at heart. Or at least the best interests when it comes to your health. Oh yeah? Well, I'm the physician. He's the bartender. When the hell did we switch jobs? Man, it was a lot more fun getting drunk with Scotty. Where is Captain Scott? Who knows? I started drinking with him six or seven bars ago. Chekhov, too. Did you know they were both on the Enterprise with Jim when it happened? Yes. I read the full report while on the shuttle traveling back from Vulcan. Of course you did. They both blamed themselves, you know. Either of them could have gone down to engineering and done... Whatever it was he did. He adjusted the primary deflector dish to emit a resonance burst to simulate the discharge of an antimatter blast to disrupt the gravimetric field that was holding the Enterprise within the temporal distortion. Um, yeah. That. Anyway, Scotty and Chekhov both figured they could have done that, too. In fact, there were 600 people on that ship, and any of them could have done it. Why the hell did it have to be one of the most decorated officers in Starfleet history to sacrifice his life? The crew complement at the time was minimal, Doctor. Only 233, including 47 refugees from the rescued Elorian transport vessel and eight civilian representatives of the news media, none of whom would have been familiar enough with Starfleet systems to have made the deflector adjustment. So in actuality, the pool of qualified personnel was only 178. Still, why did it have to be Jim? Why couldn't Harriman have done it? Or ordered someone else to do it? Because Captain Kirk has always been the hero, Doctor. That doesn't sound like a very Vulcan observation. Nevertheless, it is the truth. You and I knew James Kirk well enough to know that he would never allow another member of his crew to face peril if there were a way he could take on the risk himself. But it wasn't Jim's crew, damn it. It was Harriman's. I read in the Enterprise's logs that Captain Harriman did indeed intend to be the one to go to engineering and he even offered the command chair to Captain Kirk before heading for the turbolift. But Jim would have none of that, of course. Of course. Goddamn Boy Scout. Doctor, James T. Kirk was many things in his life, but I do not believe he was ever a Boy Scout. You know what I mean. Yes. Yes, I do. You know, Scotty doesn't think he's really dead. He said something about the distortion causing a temporal flux or some such. He said that Jim might have just winked out of the space-time continuum like he did when we got trapped by those Tholians while trying to rescue the Defiant. That was a very different phenomenon, Doctor, with extremely dissimilar parameters. Most notably that, with the Tholians, Jim was wearing a spacesuit. That would be one parameter, yes. Even so, Scotty says he expects that Jim will be back amongst the living in no time. That is highly illogical. You don't believe it's possible? Why? You did it. Did what, Doctor? Came back from the dead. In fact, most of us did. I did on that crazy planet where we had shore leave and anything we imagined appeared. As I recall, I got speared through the chest by some medieval knight of all things. Chekhov was dead in that Melkotian Wild West simulation, although I suppose that was all in our imaginations. But heck, even Scotty came back from the dead once. 
after that nomad probe killed him. I examined Scotty thoroughly, and he was as dead as you can get. But somehow Nomad brought him back to life. Maybe now it's Jim's turn. While I would like nothing better than to accept the wishful theory of Captain Scott, I must point out that it is highly improbable that anyone could survive in the vacuum of space unprotected. Even were this distortion to have somehow transported Jim elsewhere in space-time, which is itself highly unlikely, the odds that such an anomaly could have reached him prior to suffering fatal decompression are approximately 13 billion 476 million 579 to 1. You know, Spock, I bet you don't ever really calculate those odds, and instead you just make them up. I could review the computations with you if you would like, Doctor. It's actually based on rather elementary statistical theory that... Oh, God, no. The last thing I need is a computer algorithm killing my buzz, which you've already managed to do anyway. That was not my intention. Yeah, I'll just bet it wasn't. <laughs> I remember once, a long time ago, I told Jim that space was disease and danger, wrapped in darkness and silence. And that's how he died. In darkness and silence. He did tell us once that he always knew he would die alone. Well, you sure can't be more alone than floating in space. Your blood boiling in 13 seconds. At least he went quickly. In fact, with any luck, the blast that ripped a hole in the hull killed him instantly. I would not consider any death to be lucky, Doctor. Then maybe I should have said merciful instead. I remember my own father deteriorated slowly, his organs letting go of life one small bit at a time until all he wanted was just to die. But his body wouldn't let him. Compared to that, even an agonizing death over the course of 13 seconds in the vacuum of space would seem lucky. I mean merciful. The end result is the same, however. It is for all of us, Spock. It is for all of us. I don't know if Sulu told you, but he's holding a gathering of the old crew at his home in Napa Valley tomorrow. I was informed of it by his daughter when I visited the Enterprise. Demora? My God, I haven't seen her since she was the size of an Arcturian meadow cat. That was 12 years ago when Sulu got command of the Excelsior. Is she old enough to be in Starfleet now? An ensign, and chief helm officer of the Enterprise. Oh, Lord, do I feel old. But good for her. I can't imagine an Enterprise without a Sulu to steer her. So, will you be coming to the wake? I know Christine would love to see you. I am considering it. Well, I hope you do decide to show up. It wouldn't seem right without you there, Spock. It wouldn't seem whole. You, me... Scotty, Sulu, Chekhov, Uhura, Chapel. Heck, I heard that Kyle, Leslie, Rand, and even Riley are planning to show up. Maybe even Savick. It'll be like old times. A reunion with only one person missing, one absent friend. Damn it. I will not cry. Not in front of you. Doctor, it is... It's... It is all right. No, it isn't. Blast it. I should have died first. I'm older than he was. Hell, with the way I drink, I should have been dead years ago. Damn medical advances keeping us all alive way too long. But not Jim. He had to go and die saving hundreds of people. 232, to be precise. <laughs> that was really funny, Spock. I think the Federation needs more Vulcan comedians. Have you ever thought of changing professions? I have never considered a career in comedy. No. Well, maybe you should, Spock. I'm serious. That I should become a comedian? No, but that you should try to develop a sense of humor. I do possess an understanding of and appreciation for comedy, Doctor. Not as much as you could, Spock. There's nothing logical about comedy. You don't understand it or appreciate it. You just experience it and embrace it. It's one of the things that I think Jim was trying to teach you all these years. Don't take yourself too seriously, Spock. All right, Doc, I'm closing the place up for the night. Do you want me to call you a hover cab? That's all right, sir. I can escort Dr. McCoy home. Suit yourself, but wrap it up. I want to lock the front door in five minutes. Certainly, 
Thank you for your patience. Patience? That's a laugh. I'm the one with patience. I'm the doctor. Get it? I believe I do, Dr. McCoy. I just don't believe it was funny. Well, if you'd get yourself a blasted sense of humor, you'd think it was hilarious. Doctor, let me help you on with your coat. I can manage, Spock, but I meant what I said. Don't let yourself get caught in the same old routines. Change the rules a little. Every so often, be a maverick. Use a little. Cowboy diplomacy. Would you like for me to take you home, Doctor? I have a hover car across the street. No, but thank you, Spock. My apartment is only a few blocks from here, and I think I'd like to walk off the last of this buzz that I have. Very well. But, um, Spock, I did, I suppose, appreciate the company. You are welcome, Doctor. Let's not forget him, Spock. Ever. Let's remember every little detail about that crazy son of a bitch. Every blemish, every foible, every perfect little imperfection that made him the best damn starship captain. And the best friend we could ever ask for. I agree. And don't turn your back on what he was trying to teach you, Spock. Break a few rules. Be a cowboy. Every once in a while. Dr. McCoy, I shall consider it. <laughs>